welcome Robert Leal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Just manage your time. Yep. You got, you got some tips. So apparently I have to manage my time. Wish me luck. I have no uh, ability to do that whatsoever. Can you switch to my screen if that's all right? I'm going to start now. Do, do, do. I'm going to try to. All right, so I wrote a little uh, uh, presentation software for you guys. So let's see if it works. OK, uh, so this is going to be my class, um, or my talk, a little bit about how to buy our car in 60,000 milliseconds. Um, if you don't know what a millisecond is, neither do I. I'm American. We, don't s we, uh, we do it in, uh, in uh, the metric. The metric system is just beyond us. So we're just still, still trying to figure it out. Um, Thank you for coming. Uh, it's a lot of people. I appreciate it. I thought this was going to be a small con, a little tiny, a couple hundred people, maybe a little lot more people today than I expected. So I appreciate you guys coming out and staying to the last talk. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, here's some of the objectives that I'm going to go over. I'm going to talk a little bit about starting systems. Uh, so vehicle, again, this is all vehicle starting systems. We're going to talk a little bit about immobilizers. We'll talk about vehicle networks, diagnostics, uh, methods for borrowing cars, if you don't know what that is, uh, it's a euphemism for stealing cars, yes. Um, relay attacks, you might have heard of in the news, there's been other talks on relay attacks. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the more practical uh, methods for stealing cars, which is adding new keys. Um, oops, of course, I always going to mess this up. And then uh, hacking the shit out of it is always a good option as well. And we'll talk a little bit about the law. Boo, the law, boo. And we're going to learn a little bit more. I'm gonna, uh, we're going to learn about how to learn more about car hacking as well. OK, so let's move on. So let's talk a little bit about starting systems. Because in order to start a car, you have to understand how it starts. So I'm going to give you some fundamentals of how starting system works. So we're going to talk about how to hotwire a car. If you don't know what hotwiring is, it's actually using the wires itself to start the vehicle itself. So it's really simple. We connect the ignition and uh, the starter wire. There's just two wires. Usually you can find them underneath the dash. You like, you've seen the movies. You just pull those two wires. It's literally that simple, actually. You pull two wires. Um, you find the starter. You find the 12-volt uh, battery. You find the ignition. And you power, uh, you power them all at the same time. The engine will crank. Um, once you remove power from, once it's cranked, you remove power from the starter wire and you keep power on the ignition and it'll stay running. It's that simple. Um, we talk a little bit about the relays themselves. So what is a relay? Um, well, here, I, this is my first image. How do you like it? I made that myself. Uh, this is a relay. Um, a relay is, is, is literally, it takes, it's a switch. It's a, it, it takes low current, um, which is on the 85 and 86. It takes low current, and it puts it out on the, a, the 87 and 30. So you can take 12 volts. And this is how your car starts, starts it. It uses these relays internally to start the vehicle itself. We'll talk a little bit about the ignition. Um, it turns, it's the ignition wire. It's actually a physical wire called the ignition that turns the lights on, the cluster gauges. So you can find the ignition really simply if you were to hotwire the vehicle because all the lights would come on, the cluster, the gauges, um, the headlights if you had them. Um, it, it, it enables the engine controller as well. So the engine controller looks for the ignition to be on before it even turns on itself. Um, when it's off the engine, uh, it cannot and will not run. It needs that ignition wire. So it's very important when we're working with these things. So it's under understandable. The starter itself uses a relay, and it starts the engine, right? It actually turns the engine over. It makes it go and starts up. Um, it's also, uh, when it's active, uh, the vehicle will attempt to start. Uh, when it's deactive, when essentially that usually starts, usually uh, the relay starts and then stops soon after the uh, engine starts turning. So there's a sensor there that determines when the engine should, or the relay should shut off as well. There's also a third uh, uh, device in here. It's usually the body control module. On modern vehicles, when you put the key in the vehicle, and you turn the uh, ignition and you turn the controller, it actually doesn't start the car anymore. What it is is the body controller um, now monitors the key itself. Right? It's responsible for monitoring the key state. 
and, and then it might send out CAN messages. If you're not familiar with CAN, we're going to go into that pretty heavily later. Uh, but it might send out vehicle data network messages to, uh, to the rest of the vehicle to let it know what's happening. So we, it conveys this key position. So no longer uh, in, in the past vehicles, when you turn the key, it actually was like a switch. You're actually turning on and off. But now there's the body control module monitors the state of the key and determines what state it should be in. Um, and whether the ignition should be on, whether it should be cranking, or something like that. All right, what's an immobilizer? So in order to prevent this uh, uh, stealing of vehicles, uh, OEMs created uh, immobilizers. They introduced this concept where they actually authenticate the physical key itself. So immobilizers prevent or disable the fuel and the spark so the engine doesn't start, right? Boo, we're disabling it. But guess what? We're disabling it in software. We're going to figure out how, to, how software can be our friend later. Um, ultimately, the engine controller is the immobilizer. So the engine itself is what stops the vehicle from actually cranking or starting. Okay? So uh, the immobilizer is a, essentially it's the best way to describe this, at least to a bunch of a room of hackers, um, is a keychain, right? It's a chain of, 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 of different controllers that are authentic authenticating themselves, right? So we have the engine controller, which authenticates with other controllers, which authenticates at the end with the physical key itself. So it prevents the, uh, the engine from starting without authentic authentication. So if you don't have, if the key hasn't been authenticated, then the next module in the chain doesn't authenticate itself, which in turn doesn't authenticate to the engine controller itself. This prevents the vehicle uh, theft if, if the valid key isn't pre present, right? I mean, it almost eradicated uh, vehicle theft in general. Um, if you look at the, the amount of vehicle theft after the immobilizer was introduced, it's been significantly less. So let's take a look more at the mobilization process. So here, I'll, I'll just sort of the most simplest way is to just point out three different uh, controllers or ECUs, electronic controllers. So on the left, we have an, a key ECU, which is actually used to authenticate the physical key. It might be through RFID. It might be through some sort of proximity. Um, there's a lot of different uh, key authentication systems out there. Sometimes they use like R IR, infrared. Uh, things like that. And then in the middle, we have the body control module, which typically authenticates the key controller itself. Um, and then we have the engine controller itself, which is ultimately authenticates the body control module. So the user, uh, this is sort of a, just a chain of different things. We have three different channels. We have an RF channel, typically, on the left, uh, whether it's RFID or regular radio. We have a CAN bus. Uh, CAN bus is just a network. If you're not familiar with it, it's like Ethernet in a way. It's a bus topology, though. And then we have a set, usually a secondary CAN bus that connects the body controller to the engine controller. We'll call that CAN bus B. So first, we have the, uh, the, the user activates the car. Maybe they, they put the key in the ignition, or they open the door, or something like that, some sort of activation. So at that point, the key ECU authenticates the key. So it's ready to go. right? And then we move over, and we actually turn the or engage the ignition, whether that's hitting the button or starting the key turn or something like that. Some sort of ignition is activated um, by the body uh, to the body controller itself. The uh, at the at that time when the ignition is activated, the body controller and the engine controller will both challenge their respective partners. So in this case, the the key, the body controller will try to challenge the key ECU, and the engine controller will challenge the BCM. So those ch challenges will go back across. Um, the key ECU will hopefully respond to that challenge. If there's a valid key there, it'll respond. And then it'll, it'll validate itself using a, some sort of uh, crypto algorithm back to, um, back to the BCM itself. So the BCM is now valid. And so it will respond. Since it's happy, it'll take some time and respond back to the, B the engine controller from the BCM and respond to the engine controller. And th only at that point is the mobilizer bypass. So it'll enable, and then, then the uh, ignition relay will be enabled. Sometimes the BCM pulls up on the ignition relay, and the engine control will pull down on it, thus causing the relay to activate. Um, so we enable the starter relay as well at this point. Uh, and the vehicle, if everything is done well, will start. That's the idea. Let's see if that's true. But well, that's sort of the general overview of how uh, immobilizer systems work. Is we have these three different controllers, and they will just constantly be challenging each other to, uh, to validate if there's a valid key in the vehicle. 
Vehicle networks. So let me give you a little uh, overview of different physical layers. This is more for reference, but uh, it could be helpful later as I talk about other, uh, other physical layers later in the talk. Just sort of want to give you guys a primer on different physical layers. So controller area network is a CAN bus. Uh, so when I talk about that, there are a lot of different uh, physical layers uh, or flavors of CAN bus. Uh, there's ISO 11898-2, which is called dual wire CAN. There's fault tolerant CAN and single wire CAN. So these are the most common types of CAN buses that we'll see in vehicles today. And there's a new one coming out. Uh, it'll be available in the next couple of years called ISO 11898-7, which is CAN FD. So if you're uh, working with CAN bus, you need to uh, update yourself on the new CAN specification. There are some UART uh, networks that we will talk about later. Um, ISO 9141, not so much, but we will definitely talk about um, 11.17.987, which is called LINBUS, which is another, um, it's called a local interconnect network. It's UART based, it's a one wire 12 volt network that uh, signals uh, data across it very slowly, typically runs about uh, 19, 1900 baud, uh, 1900 bits per second, 19.2 typically. Um, so it's a, little, a slow network, but works great for key and key authentication. Um, and then there's this thing called Ethernet. I don't know if you're familiar with it, uh, but they're adding it to cars now. Um, so it's 10 base TX, uh, really standard uh, Ethernet in vehicles. And then we have a new specification for Ethernet, which is 10 base T1, or 100 base T1, sorry, um, which is automotive Ethernet, which is a one pair Ethernet, which is happening now in vehicles uh, today. Um, we'll take a look a little at the OBD2 connector. So how do you interface with these systems? We'll take a look at the OBD2 connector, and this is my awesome ASCII art again. Um, so this is an OBD2 connector. If you haven't seen one, it's sort of a, um, a trapezoidal uh, connector that's inside of your vehicle, typically underneath the dash. Uh, if you can reach your hand underneath it, you'll find that there's a 16-pin connector uh, about this big, if you guys can tell. Uh, not very, not very large, but there's a lot of. It's a really common connector. It's actually been there s in the U.S. since '96 in newer vehicles, in Europe in like 2005 in newer vehicles um, have required this connector. Um, so look for it. It has a lot of information. All of the CAN buses, and in fact, everything I'll be talking about today, you connect to this connector. And for most most of the networks, specifically the CAN networks, you can find all of the um, the the CAN bus on this connector itself. So which pins is it on? Um, typically, pins six and fourteen are going to be your ISO eleven eight oh nine, which is your standard CAN bus. Um, sometimes we'll see other networks brought out to this. Uh, connector um, and there's discretionary pins that allow us to or allow the uh, manufacturer of the vehicle to bring out their own uh, their own individual or custom networks to these connectors um, and specifically um, but not but the truth is not all networks are brought out here sometimes we have to go to the modules that might be connecting to these systems um, and we might actually have to connect directly to modules or pin or wiring harnesses at the module itself. Um, standard Ethernet does exist at this connector as well. Um, pins 3, 11, and 12, and 13 are RX and TX high and low, respectively. Um, I don't really recall off the top of my head which ones are which, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pinouts. In fact, I should have referenced pinouts.ru. It's a Russian site that indicates a lot of these OBD2 connectors. Uh, it's really helpful. Um, and pin 8 is an enable pin. You put that to VBAT, and you'll turn your Ethernet on if you have Ethernet at those pins. So always a good good idea to check that out. And it's just standard Ethernet, four-wire Ethernet, that you can bring into your PC as well. Um, it's often just used for diagnostics. It's also referred to as DOIP or di diagnostics over IP as well. So that's something that's happening that's new. Um, just CAN, CAN frames themselves. I'm going to talk about them a lot later. Uh, CAN frames have really two distinct features. There's arbitration ID. I call it ARB, A-R-B here. Um, and then there's eight, up to eight bytes of data per frame. That's the maximum amount of da data per, uh, per frame of CAN bus. This is just the limitation of the, of the CAN bus itself. Um, there's also, that's an 11-bit frame. And there's also a 29-bit frame. And you'll notice just the ID itself is a little bit bigger. That's really the difference. Uh, you can have up to eight bytes. I show six here, but there can be up to eight bytes as well on a 29-bit uh, frame. So we have a 11-bit frame, 3-2-1 frame, and then we have a 29-bit frame. And we'll be working with both of those when I show some examples later. Again, eight bytes maximum per frame. Um, there are There's something called K-line, which looks like this. So when we talk about that later, it's essentially a three-byte header. It's UART-based, and it has can have an unlimited number of data 
Uh, the frame size isn't really limited with K-Line when we talk about that later. There's Linbus as well. Um, Linbus is a single byte header, um, and it can have really from, from one to eight bytes of data depending on um, what the actual identifier is. There's different ranges of identifiers that are allowed to have different uh, size payloads. Okay, maybe. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about di diagnostics. I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into uh, the functions and services that are that are part of your vehicle. Um, so diagnostics, uh, when we talk about vehicles, it's a series of methods or functions that essentially allow you allow you as a, a as a, a hacker or engineer or service technician to communicate directly with the controllers in the vehicle itself. So um, it's a request response protocol. So for every time we send a request to the controller, we should get a response back if the controller is awake and communicating, okay? Um, so a user transmits a message, typically CAN bus is the way to do diagnostics on ve and vehicles at, the, at that diagnostic connector that I showed you earlier. Um, typically we'll transmit a message. Um, we use a transport layer called ISO 15765-2. Um, almost every OEM or manufacturer uses ISO 15765-2 for their transport protocol. So it's a really, if, you, if there's anything you Google and try to learn how something works, ISO 15765-2 is a really good one. I'm gonna go over it as well in this talk so that you guys aren't, aren't lost when I'm talking about it as well. There's another transport protocol called TP 2.0. Actually, there's one called TP 1.6 and TP 2.0 for VW. So they went a little bit and uh, made their own transport protocol. So they're a little bit different. Um, but for the most part, everybody else uses ISO 15765. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, some other high-level protocols, uh, standard uh, diagnostics is ISO 15, 15301, but then we have this other thing called enhanced diagnostics. So essentially, all of the functions that you can ever hope to do on a vehicle um, use ISO enhanced diagnostics. So something called ISO 14230, which is also called Keyword 2000, 14229, and GM LAN for Ge General Motors in the United States, a little bit in, the US, in Europe too, Opal and such. Um, Here's a small list of interesting services that I'm going to be talking about later. And so when I talk about services, I'm really talking about individual functions that these controllers can do, right? And these, this is the, this is the, these are things that you can actually go to a vehicle and ask the vehicle to do. So start diagnostics or initiate diagnostics is a way to ask the controller to do something interesting, uh, to turn it into a specific mode. There's something called ECU reset, which you can imagine how much fun you'd have when you're driving down the road and you're resetting your ECU at, at speeds. It's really fun. Um, reading codes, there's something called DTCs. Uh, sometimes you can read these codes from the controllers themselves. Communication control, you can actually tell controllers to stop transmitting or to transmit uh, their information. Read parameter by ID, so you can actually get information or read data directly from like static or dynamic information from the vehicle itself. Read memory by address, that's right. You can actually ask the controller uh, to give you its memory. And, and I don't wanna underemphasize this. This is literally the best service that's ever existed, especially for somebody who's getting into like embedded systems. Start with automotive. You, you talked to, you, if you saw the la a couple talks ago, you talked about how you had to de, you know, desolder a chip from the board and, and hook up devices to it to, to read the memory from it. Um, with cars, we make it a lot easier. We just give you a service and you just read it. And it's pretty simple for the most part. I'll show you why in a little bit. But for the most part, for a lot of controllers, you could just ask it for the memory and it'll just give it to you. It's quite nice. Uh, they're, they're changing that. The good, new, good news is that they do more talks. They're, they're fixing these problems. Uh, one is called security access. It's the way they're fixing the problem by doing this thing called security access where you actually have to do a secure uh, seed key exchange um, and security access allows you to do that. And one, uh, there's another one called input output control where you can actually control like things like lights and horn and a bunch of other features as well. Um, and last uh, is routine control. I think it's last. Um, routine control allows you to actually activate certain functions, sort of macros, if you will, of a series of functions. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Oh, and last is test or present, which, oh, second to last is test or present. And then reserved for OEM, they actually have their own range of like future use cases or like, like uh, spe you know, very, very specific to their, to their own f internal functions, uh, a range of services that they can use as well. So let's dissect a single frame. So, um, so let's take a look at a single frame of CAN bus. 
Um, so again, we have a, this is an 11-bit message, 70032F120000000. So that's the max size. So it's a single frame of CAN, CAN bus. And this is actually a request to read. So, so if we look at service 22, do you see the 22 there? This is a request to read a parameter ID called F120. So at the very end of it, we have this thing called padding, which is just we fill it in with zeros. You can fill it in with whatever value you want. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really count towards the message itself. Um, and then next, we have the parameter ID itself. So the F120 is a parameter ID. In this case, we're reading the VIN from this particular OEM. Different OEMs, this PID will mean something else. So if I use this on a Ford, or if I use it on a Renault, or if I use it on a VW, it's going to be a completely different parameter. So that's something you got to learn that's unique to each OEM. But the services themselves, like this, service 22, Service ID 22 is request PID. So I gave it a PID, F120, and I used the, that particular service 22 to request the PID. And then the next byte left is really the transport protocol, that ISO 15765-2. In this case, there's a three there. That's how we know that there's three bytes inside of the frame. So 322F120 is the entire message. And the zero indicates that this entire frame message will live in a single frame. So we put a zero on the first nibble with the first byte to indicate that. And the last thing, the actual address itself, is the controller ID. It's the controller that we want to talk to. So if individual controllers will have their own identifier that you can talk to them. In this case, 70 is the engine controller. And that's pretty universal across all vehicles, uh, really throughout the world on CAN bus, 70 is talking to engine controllers. So let's take a look at a, uh, a multi-frame message as well. So I'm teaching a little bit about this. So here's a multi-frame message itself. So we have essentially four messages in this request, or is this actually a response? Um, so we did a VIN request, and maybe we want to get the VIN. This is like a VIN returning back to us. So the VIN itself is 17 characters. The VIN, if you don't know, is the vehicle identification number, and it's the number that uniquely identifies each vehicle out there in the, in the world. So if you wanted to re request the VIN, um, the, the message above, which the first one I showed you, is how you request it. And then below is how it returned back to you. And it returned back to you in multiple frames, right? So we have 78 is actually the response ID from the controller. And then we have a bunch of other data. And I'll go into that a little bit. So let's take a look at the first frame of this multi-frame request. Um, the first, uh, the, f the VIN characters will be at the end. They'll actually be part of the payload of the frame itself. So the first three p characters there. Then again, we have that parameter ID, that F120 is actually going to be replayed back to us in our, in our response that's coming back from the controller itself. Um, we have a po This is a positive response. And how do we know it's a positive response? Well, our initial, if you recall, our initial request was 22. That's a service. If you add 40 hex to that 22, it's, you get 62. Um, that 40 hex plus the original service equals a uh, positive response. So that's how we know it's a positive, meaning it's successful. I'll talk about negative responses later and what it means when you get those. Um, the next, uh, the, the, the previous three uh, nibbles, or 12 bits, 0, 1, 4, indicates the data length of our message. Um, now it's a multi-frame message, so we're going to need a little bit more data to describe how many um, bytes are going to be in our total message. In this case, 14 hex, 20 bytes. And the one, that first nibble of the first frame, indicates the frame type again. And this is the first frame of a multi-frame message. So the one indicates the first frame. Uh, the 78, we had 70 zero before. 78 is actually still from the engine controller. So again, this is diagnostics. So we're sending a request to the controller. It's returning a response back. It uses 78 to return all of its re responses back to us. So the next byte, or the next frame, is what we call a flow control frame. It's us sending, again, we have padding. Um, we actually have a separation time. We have block separation. I'm going to go through this because it's not as important. Um, uh, we have a continue, and we have the frame type 3 indi indicating it's a flow control frame. And we're talking to the engine controller. So if you recall, we send a request to the engine controller. It sent us uh, the first frame back. But we need some rules to tell that controller that, hey, you're gonna, we're gonna, we want to receive the rest of the message, but we want to receive it at a certain speed, thus the separation time. We want to have you wait a certain period of time before we send a flow, another flow control. That's a block separation. And we want you to continue. That's the send continuation uh, frame, the zero of the three zero in that byte. So, so there's a lot of information there. 
So then we get the consecutive frames coming back to us. We get the ne next seven characters of the VIN. We get a row encounter to indicate that the this is the first of the of the uh, first frame of the of the consecutive frames. We get a two to indicate this is a consecutive frame because the frame type is now a two, and then it comes from the engine controller, so it's 70E8 is our response. And then we get the final frame in our multi-frame message, which is the remaining data in the VIN. And then just like the one before, it's got the row encounter increments by one. And then we get a frame, our frame type is still a two because it's still a consecutive frame and all frames uh, associated with this message will be have a two there and then a 78, okay. So now let's talk a little bit about how we borrow cars, right? So we've gotten all these things. So let's talk about some of the methods that might you might use, some of the ideas that you might use to, to borrow a vehicle. So remember, starting systems are controlled by modules, electronic control modules. Um, very few physical methods are left to prevent the theft of vehicles. What I mean by that is there's no, there used to be like, uh, locks on the steering wheel and locks to, uh, to prevent you from moving the vehicle out of park. Um, all of those are easily bypassed or just removed from vehicles nowadays because of immobilizers. So it's very rare to have these steering wheel locks or column locks, etc. cetera. Um, physical keys are gonna be replaced by push buttons or electronic keys. So proximity keys uh, are nice. Uh, we can do these, re uh, we can, uh, proximity keys, we can relay, uh, uh, we can do these relay attacks, which I'll go into a little bit more about how we can extend the range of these attacks, or we can actually extend the range of your key fob now up to 1.5 uh, kilometers, uh, line of sight, which is nice. Um, and keys, of course, are programmable, right? Manufacturers don't want people to, when they lose all of their keys to their vehicle, to just have to replace the entire vehicle or whole modules in the vehicle. It's very expensive. So we need to make these uh, programmable. So keys are addable um, to your vehicle using programming methods as well. So here's a key programmer, obviously. Look at that. You see that? I made that myself. <laughs> and there's a key programmer. This is all my cool uh, ASCII art. Um, so again, systems rely on a chain of trust. Right, we authenticate physical to authenticate physical keys. Right, so bypassing the trust anywhere along that chain will start the vehicle. Right, so we can bypass it either from the keys perspective, from the body controller to the key, or from the key, or the engine controller to the body controller. Right, so mos immobilizer bypasses are popular applications, and at least in the U.S where I'm from, um, we have remote starts. I don't think they exist at all in Europe, but it gets really cold in Michigan, and it's really nice to get into a warm car. So we have these remote start applications, and we have to bypass the immobilizer for these applications, and so it's a really common function in the United States. Um, and OEMs typically use proprietary security algorithms, right? They roll their own security algorithms, and if there's anything we've ever learned from DEF CON or any of these hacker conferences is don't roll your own uh, um, security algorithm. They do it all the time, good for us. Um, so, and when they do implement standard algorithms, they don't always implement security correctly. And that's really common is now, nowadays. So let's, those are the few ways to sort of steal a car. Let's go into the individual uh, attack surfaces themselves. So let's talk about a relay attack itself. So a relay attack is, um, it's, not based, uh, it's not based on an electrical relay, but rather on the concept of relaying the message. So when we talk about relays, not the actual physical relay, but relaying the messages from one point to another, essentially extending the range of your key fob. So let's, what is the concept of a relay attack? Well, you have to have a passive vehicle uh, system, right? Or a passive key system. So one of these key in your, keep the key in your pocket kind of systems, you don't actually have to turn the key. And at least two attackers, um, or two, two antennae. Um, one attacker will be near the physical key of the vehicle, another attacker near the vehicle itself, and there's the key. Um, typically, a key will work, a short, range con short range communications, our RF is usually over 150 kilohertz, and the long range RF components, usually 315, 433, or 900 megahertz, depending on which country you're in. Um, US uses all three, but I think Europe just sticks to 433 and maybe 900. I think those are your two options. So let's take a look at the, here's an antenna that's near the attacker's key. And we, ha we establish a two-way communication channel, um, two-way comms, uh, and we upconvert the uh, initial signal of the antenna um, to from the 315 
or, f or 150 kilohertz to 2.4 gigahertz, and we talk to a uh, receiving antenna. And so we essentially extend the range near the key of the actual key itself, and then we have w and the other antenna lives near the vehicle. There's my Ferrari. Um, lives near the vehicle. It's literally the best Ferrari I could afford. Um, so here we have our key near the vehicle, and we are allowed to extend the range of the individual ve of the vehicle itself. So it depends. T timing is really important because you have this uh, range. Uh, uh, you're, you're transmitting a message from a key. It's getting retransmitted or up up uh, the upshift the. Uh, the uh, frequency to a different frequency to extend the range. And, and because of this upshifting of the frequency and downshifting of the frequency, we have some time and some latency there. So obviously the timing of the messages uh, that the car expects really makes the range change. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the hardware. If you haven't had a chance, check out Wired. Um, there's a company called the Unicorn Team, or called Qho 360, a, Jap or a Chinese uh, research firm that made their own um, uh, really low-cost relay attack devices. Now they made them themselves, and they talked a little. They had a really good talk uh, about a year and a half ago at um, Hack in the Box. Um, if you had a chance to go, you would have seen it. It was uh, it described how to essentially build your own, and really for the cost of like thirty dollars, uh, you could build your own. I'm sure you have to source a lot of Chinese components. They were very lucky to be in China. But uh, really, at, a, at the cost of $100, $200 each, they're very low cost. And, you can, and I've seen them on uh, Alibaba. You can find uh, uh, really low cost relay attack devices out there today. So it's a really economical way to, to borrow cars if you needed to. Um, the other way is to add a new key, right? Um, don't re you don't have you don't want to get near the actual physical key. Maybe you just want to plug into the car if you have access to the OBD2 port, and you can then just add your own key. Maybe you got one in your pocket, just want to use it for something. Um, so dealers need to service the vehicles. This is a big problem for OEMs. Some OEMs don't let the dealers m add new keys, but for the ones who do, um, this is the reason why this is a problem. Uh, is because it's easy to add them, right? Uh, so dealer tools can add keys, right? Dealer tools can be reverse, en reverse engineered. Uh, dealer tools run Windows or Java, right? So that can be reverse engineered. And window and Java applications can be reverse engineered. So because of the, all of these things, um, security is very low on these systems. Um, often security access service 27 is used for privilege access. And I'll, I'm going to show you what that looks like a little bit later. Um, to test if a function requires security access, here's, this set, here's a request we could send. So here's an example. We're sending a request to the engine controller um, to, to ask it to learn a new key. We use service 31, which is a really common service for these. And it'll respond back to us with what's called a negative response. And we, that's indicated with the 7F here, just before the, uh, the 037F. 7F indicates security access or, or uh, negative response. And the 33, which is the negative response code, which is the reason why it failed, uh, indicates it's denied because uh, security access is denied. So there's a few different security access negative response codes. 33 or anything in the three something range is usually something to do with security. So anytime there's a security access request or a request that requires security access, you might see a response like this, a negative response. So in order to bypass the security access, we need, uh, we need uh, the security access routine or some sort of security access algorithm and in order to bypass it. So let's get the OEM scan tool, right? That seems easy. We'll just borrow it from eBay, right? And how do you do that? You buy it off of eBay, and then you turn around, you sell it once you're done with it for the same price you bought it for. It's usually, my, usually the best way. Um, a lot of these applications just use Java. Java is really common. And if it doesn't use Java, it's even easier probably because it's some old application that they don't maintain anymore. Um, so we find uh, references and files, directories, and in our example, we found uh, uh, one that I'm going to talk about. We found this uh, app, uh, this thing called ESUs. We didn't know what ESU meant. I did a little bit of searching and found found that it meant like encrypted storage unit or something like that. So let's look at a hex view of an ESU, and you can tell that it looks super encrypted, right? 
I don't know, there's lots and lots of entropy, not much structure. So my guess is it's encrypted. Um, I won't, I mean, it's really the whole file, so it's not that big. It took a lot less time when I was doing it later. Okay, so lots of entropy, probably encrypted. So we have to find a function that decrypts the file. That's what I did. Um, I could have tried to see if the tool would decrypt it for me, but I just reverse engineered. It was a Java application. So we looked inside of the Java application. I found a, I, re I decompiled all of the Java code. There's a lot of de Java decompilers out there, tons of them. They all work. They all seem to work really well because um, Java isn't really secure. And there was one function or class called encrypted security unlock. That was a big hint, right? So we found that, and we found it used this really weird method called UC. Not sure what UC meant, but it seemed uh, cryptic enough to probably be what we were looking for. Um, so I found another class called UC, and Java code from the OEM kind of looked like this. That looks like it's doing something really odd, right? Here we have this system trying to, like, I don't know, listener. It didn't, it didn't look like anything else in, in all of the other classes themselves. So we, uh, so I what I did is I just patched it. I just made my own version of this. Uh, I made my own function that called this UC function, and I pointed it to the directory of all the ESU files. Right, and I just asked it. I know it's just a bunch of stuff. This is it. So all we really had to do, instead of de trying to figure it out, is just point it to the text files themselves. So I wrote my own uh, decryptor. As you can see, it has some information about the OEM here. Um, I gave it the home path of my ESU files. I had it output to the file called motherload text. And, and when I got, when, uh, and then just had it out, uh, just decrypt the data, just whatever was in there, it just is just a general unlock. And the decrypted file, that same ES ESU file, just turned into JavaScript, right? And inside of the JavaScript, we saw these big arrays. Um, uh, C key calc, it, it asked for a, a function called calculate seed, which is exactly what uh, Service 27 uses as a seed. Um, it did this special math here. And it output it, and output the it returned the uh, the um, seed from its ret main return. So here we are. We have the actual security algorithm. In fact, with this method, I dumped the entire the OEM's entire seed key, um, uh, uh, all of the ones that they had ever stored on any vehicle ever. So that was quite nice. Um, and they also they didn't just support their own. There's a lot of crossover between this OEM and other OEMs, so it actually had extra uh, from different car manufacturers as well. So that was quite, quite nice. So there's two modules that we need to work with when we're learning a key, 720 and 728. This is a different OEM, actually. Um, and 70 and 78, uh, this is the engine controller. So we had a body controller and an engine controller. And here's what a key learn might look like on a separate control on a separate OEM. Um, so we request diagnostic trouble codes just to see if there's any issues um, with reprogramming the key. There were none. So I actually used a separate key programming tool and just watt monitored it, it as it was doing a key uh, doing a key program and documented it here. So we read the number of keys programmed. We uh, switch to a programming mode and we see that it returned a negative response, which says security access is required in this situation. No big deal. Uh, we'll just request a seed. Uh, we need to switch our mode. We need to start diagnostics. So we do this enhanced mode diagnostics. And then we ask for a key or a seed, sorry. We ask for a seed to come back. What happens is we take the seed and we turn it into a key using a special algorithm that we maybe we got from this, the scan tool or something like that, the one that I just dumped just before this. We have to use some sort of algorithm on this seed. So let's see what this. Uh, uh, quick pause here. Let's see what the actual OEM does. The security access we found just bef before this is from another vehicle. We really haven't had a chance yet to reverse engineer this one. So let's research. Uh, if you want to, this OEM, a lot of lot was done with Chris, uh, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek. They have a good paper on how to reverse engineer this particular OEM's uh, um, security access algorithms. In fact, it was their first paper that they did. That's a hint. Um, so let's take a look at the response that we saw this tool do. 
Um, so the, the tool sent a key response, which was equal to the seed. So scratch your head for a second and say, hey, Robert, wait, the, I got a positive response. Uh, the module, oh, this was supposed to be a positive response. I got a different negative response. It wasn't security access denied. It was, hey, wait, uh, your, your access is correct. You just have to wait a little while for it. Say, so I thought this was security access, but it's not. The actual key for on this OEM, and I, I found out later, it was essentially for like 10, 15 years, they didn't have any security access to program a key. Uh, you could just simply send the same, whatever you saw as your seed was your key. So the algorithm was seed equals key. It's pretty simple. But there's a little bit more information here is you actually had a time delay. And anybody who's done these keys before will say, oh, I know exactly which OEM that is. So there was a slight time delay. It said time delay not expired. So you need to, wa you need to wait a period of time. Um, in fact, you had to wait for 10 minutes specifically. But 10 minutes later, right, we have this positive response, key accepted. It's happy now. Um, and we are now in programming mode. Now I can simply send a 3101716B, which is this routine access control. I saw the tool do it, so now I can replay it anytime I want. And I can go to different vehicles and just program new keys into them. Uh, all I have to do is wait 10 minutes, um, and there is no security. So some OEMs use some security, others do not. So that's just something to be aware of. Just having a, a key programming tool will help you get there. And again, you can borrow them from eBay. OK, so we introduce the new key after we've unlocked it, and we get a positive response. And if we request to see how many keys are programmed again, it increments from 02, which was, it was what it was before, to 03. Now we have three keys programmed, which is good. That means our key is now should be working. And sure enough, I was able to start the vehicle after that. Success, we have a key, and we can drive it away. Uh, it just took me 10 minutes. Now, that might sound like a lot. That's not 60,000 milliseconds, Robert. But in some cases, uh, that's all you need is just no security, just 10 minutes is this the only security there. And last me the last method is kind of just to hack the shit out of it, right? So I don't know what time, how do I have in time? Probably like one minute left. So I'll be really fast here. Um, so we need to find uh, a way to um, uh, bypass the emo um, Bypass the immobilizer. Um, so we have lots of cha channels. We have this chain of trust, which we already did talk about. Um, here's a wiring diagram in ASCII. So that's pretty cool. Nobody likes that. But if you notice, there's a secure K line. I looked up a wiring diagram off the internet, and there's a secure K line. And there's some LIN traffic associated with this request. Um, and I did a lot of research just to kind of get uh, it looked very cryptographically secure. In fact, when we did dump the firmware on this, dump the flash memory, we found a lot of S boxes. And if you know S boxes is AES, so we thought for sure this is gonna be really tough until we found that, of course, we dumped the firmware, and guess what? Also, this the keys are in, f in the memory as well. So let's send a request to read memory. So this is kind of what it looked like on CAN bus. But we needed, we needed um, uh, uh, this time when we wanted to read uh, the memory, we did require security access. So we had to unlock the controller um, using that method that we described earlier about how to reverse engineer the factory scan tool. We were able to quickly move through and reverse engineer using that, um, the security access algorithms that the OEM had provided for us in their scan tool. And even if you don't want to reverse engineer it, you could have the OEM scan tool unlock the device, just plugging it in, and then take over uh, its session and start sending uh, memory read requests to dump the firmware as well. So that was another option as well. So we needed to find the target processor. We had to open it up. Um, once we had it, we had the firmware. We just used IDA. We found the AES uh, secret key lived in this particular memory address because it kept referencing this uh, address. Um, this is on a real vehicle. I'll show you the it in just a second. Um, we were able to find the, there's actually a key identifier as well, a key fob ID, which was required for um, bypassing as well. We found that as mem in memory. So I could walk up to the vehicle and essentially with, the, with AES, which we know the security algorithm, with just the secret key and the key fob ID, I was able to um, start the vehicle. 
So uh, we just calculate the cryptographic response, and I have a small video of me. Let's see if I can look at there's me. Look at no key. It's hard to see. Look at no key driving. Don't look at the car. It's, that's not important. Here it is, driving with a car key in the vehicle. It's pretty exciting. So I was able to borrow my own car. It was mine, potentially. Um, and uh, that's what I tell the cops. Um, so uh, we were able to just plug in, essentially connect to the uh, vehicle and without a key, do that. So let's talk about the law. First of all, I'm not a lawyer, uh, that's the truth. But I do play one on stage. And in the US, we have DCMA, so we're allowed to, uh, and here's the exemption that we have in the United States. I don't know if you guys have it here, so I apologize if you don't. But in the US, they just recently uh, made it legal to hack cars. And specifically, we can hack cars of our, our own car, right? We can do it to our own, um, as, long as, it's, uh, 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 as long as it's research. So we we're allowed to do that here, in the, in the, in the, at least in the United States. But in my experience, I've been doing this now um, for, I mean, I've been hacking cars for about 20 years now. Um, OEMs are pretty open. I've only had one cease and desist in my life, which is pretty good. Um, maybe I'll get two after this. Um, but we got to proceed with caution. Um, if it's your car, you're probably good. If it's not, don't do that. Just don't crash into anyone. It's always a good step when you're doing car hacking. And don't steal cars. You should borrow them, right? So let's do that. OK. Um, a little bit about how to learn more. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I might be over. Um, I think I'm over a little bit. So I do host a class at Black Hat about car hacking. Um, I do on-site car hacking. But you can also vis visit our website, carhackingvillage.com. Follow me on Twitter. And you can also use the Google thing. Also, one real good shout out for somebody else that's not me, um, comma.ai has a really good GitHub. They're trying to build databases of car information. Um, I really love it. Uh, check it out. Uh, thank you very much, and merci. Thanks. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I think I think we we are making just one question, uh, and so then we are going to terminate uh, the talks uh, because you can meet obviously you can meet Robert after the talk. So uh, and I'll be doing I'll be doing a workshop. And, and he's uh, yeah so he's doing a workshop, and uh, you can meet him uh, at his workshop. Ask him anything you want. Enjoy what he has to show you. So uh, just one question in order for us to finish. Anyone? Ah, Cyril, premier rang ici. If you take the defender's side of, uh, of things, uh, what kind of uh, forensics can you do on a car that maybe acts like that? <coughs> well. I don't know if it's on. Okay, can you? Okay, so from a forensics point of view, all of these messages that I'm sending should never really be there, right? Unless a dealer's tool is, is hooked up. Now, if a dealer tool is hooked up, they probably use a very standard way of requesting this information. And most of the time, when I'm doing it, I'm using a non-standard dealer tool. Um, so I think it's probably easy to see with timing, and it's also easy to see with the messages that are sent that something unusual is happening on the network. Because of how closed these systems are, any unusual message is a red flag immediately. So it'd be really easy from a, from a, uh, from a uh, forensic standpoint to determine that this was something bad was happening on this car. But then you gotta store it, you gotta transmit it, you gotta notify the end users and, and some service. So, and again, I'll be doing a workshop, uh, I think Sal C something like that. Um, I'll be doing a workshop. I don't have a, not enough for everybody, so, but it's a small workshop, but please come and hang out and ask me some questions afterwards, but I have to head right there. So that's where I'll be if you need me. Thanks, bye. Robert, thank you very much.